Greetings from the World Health Organization. Over the past 15 years, malaria death rates have plunged. The progress made between around 2000 and around 2015 in the fight against malaria was monumental. Access to malaria prevention and treatment was greatly increased and malaria cases and death were cut by about half. And all of this was in large part the result of a massive global investment in wiping out malaria. When things were scaled up, like bed nets, vector control, initially you could see that we were bringing the burden down. What is scary is for the last sort of seven years, we're not making progress. We got to the point where we are no longer able to drop the death toll below its threshold that we've reached. That clearly indicated that we have done a really fantastic job, but uh, to some extent, the tools that we have in hands basically have reached the fundamental protective limit. The obvious question is what do we do now? Mosquitoes are resilient organisms. They are adapting to be resistant to traditional vector control methods. Similarly, the parasite itself is adapting to be resistant to anti-malarial drugs. Researchers continue to improve upon current strategies that have shown great efficacy in the past. This includes finding new compounds for insecticide-treated bed nets and developing new anti-malarial drugs. A lot of people are trying to come up with new tools that can be implemented additionally or as an alternative to current strategies that we have. Some of the most exciting new developments are in the area of modified mosquitoes, vaccines, and monoclonal antibodies. But in order to understand the new tools, how they work, and why they're needed, you first have to really understand what we're up against. Malaria is a very ancient disease that has been with us since really our very beginning. There are more than 3,000 different species of mosquitoes, and the only mosquitoes that carry the malaria parasite belong to a single genus called Anopheles. The most severe form of malaria is caused by the parasite Plasmodium falciparum. If malaria is detected and treated within the first 48 hours of symptoms, most cases of the illness are mild and easily resolved. However, if it's not diagnosed and treated quickly, the parasite count can grow rapidly, leading to coma and even death. I trained as a pediatrician in the district hospital I was in. The wards just filled up with malaria. I could admit to the high dependency unit five kids in a night, in one night. I grew up in a village and I don't know even any single person in Burkina Faso who have not experienced malaria. And this is the same thing all over West Africa. In 2020, 29 countries accounted for 96% of the world's malaria cases. All of those countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. Four of those countries accounted for over half of all malaria deaths. It's a whole chunk of humanity that's severely held back by a treatable disease. So we should, we should just solve it, you know? The malaria parasite life cycle is quite complex. You get from the mosquito into the human host, passing through the liver, and then through the red blood cells in the bloodstream, and then back into the mosquito. So, in order to control malaria, you have to break the cycle somewhere. The question is where and how. One strategy that has been used for years is to stop the cycle by controlling the vector, the mosquitoes. This comes down to three main strategies keep the mosquitoes from biting people, reduce or eliminate the mosquito population that is transmitting malaria, or manipulate the mosquito so that it is not an effective host for the parasite. 
probably the most popular strategy at the moment that is still in the lab but has potential to be utilized in the field is the genetic control of mosquito populations. And these genetic traits can be of two different kinds. One is called population replacement, where you replace a population that is capable of transmitting malaria with a population that is incapable of doing so. And one is called population suppression, because you actually induce sterility in those mosquitoes and by the end you reduce the number of mosquitoes that can transmit the disease. One of the paradigm shifts that we are working on is gene drive. If you take the conventional foundation of genetics, any specific gene of interest has a 50-50 chance of being transmitted to the next generation. In a wild population, the trait of interest will quickly disappear in the sea of mosquitoes that have not been genetically modified. Gene drive makes it possible to get around this mechanism. It gives the gene of interest 70, 80, or even 100% chance of being transmitted to the next generation. There's a lot of excitement around the potential for this approach. It could be a game changer. There are also concerns around modifying or eliminating a species. These are questions that both researchers doing the work and communities where the intervention would be deployed are grappling with. So what will happen maybe in 10 or 15 or 20 years? What if something is, uh, is going wrong? That's a really very valid question. But every year you have about 600,000 people dying from malaria. Something is already wrong. People really want to understand what risk is it for us and what is the benefit it's going to add to our life. It's extremely important to build trust. How can I make sure that whenever, you know, this technology is ready, it's going to solve more my problem than, you know, bringing more problem to me? What if there was a way to change the mosquito without genetic modification? Scientists have discovered a way to do that for a different species of mosquito, Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that carries viruses such as dengue, yellow fever, zika, and chikungunya. They modify this mosquito's ability to host and transmit these viruses by introducing a naturally occurring bacteria called Wolbachia. Wolbachia is this really interesting intracellular bacteria of insects. Up to 50% of all insect species have Wolbachia naturally. But there's a, a number that don't, including a range of mosquitoes. When you introduce the Wolbachia bacteria to the Aedes aegypti mosquito, it makes it harder for viruses to replicate inside the mosquito. It also has a mechanism that mimics gene drive, pushing the virus-limiting trait through to future generations. It's a natural gene drive that also prevents transmission of pathogens from the mosquito to humans. Uh, you know, who would have thought? Obviously, there's been a lot of interest in trying to transfer this sort of technology to the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Volbachia bacteria are not so good at colonizing Anopheles mosquitoes for reasons that are still unknown and that we are trying to understand. Until recently, there's been little incentive in, in studying mosquito biology. If you can kill mosquitoes, why should you study them? However, it's becoming more and more apparent that it's only by understanding better how parasites are transmitted that we can also come up with uh, interesting and novel ideas that can help um, tackle uh, malaria transmission. Controlling mosquitoes is just one possible point of attack. There's also the option of attacking the parasite once it's inside the human host. In the late 1960s, scientists began searching for a malaria vaccine. But it's much harder to develop a vaccine for a parasite than a virus. You're chasing a complicated and evolving target. And so the scale of uh, the challenge is, is much harder. In 2021, the WHO approved the first ever malaria vaccine, and it was groundbreaking. What we're witnessing today is the deployment for the first time in history of a malaria vaccine, which happens to also be a first vaccine against a human malaria parasite. While the first formulation of the vaccine is only about 30% effective, 
Scientists are using this foundation to find new ways to improve upon its efficacy, including combining the vaccine with preventative drugs, administering the vaccine seasonally to increase immune responses during the rainy months when transmission rates are higher, and creating multi-stage vaccines that target different stages of infection. Technologies have moved very rapidly, so there's a lot of good work trying to find malaria vaccine candidates. Researchers are optimistic that continued focus on these strategies could create a vaccine with a much stronger defense. The advances in vaccine research have also provided a foundation for developing another tool for malaria prevention, monoclonal antibodies. Similar to vaccines, monoclonal antibodies provide the body a boosted defense against disease, but they are different in one key way. Rather than train the immune system to defend against future infections, monoclonal antibodies are an injection of ready-to-fight molecules. Monoclonal, I think, has a lot of potential. So it's a laboratory-made antibodies. So they take antibodies from patient, they clone it. It's a single clone. This is why monoclonal. And then they're produced in large quantities. And then you give an injection. The results that have been published are very promising. The challenge is, can we make it affordable in low to middle income countries? And uh, the scale we're talking about, it's still early days. Um, it's very exciting, but I think we still need to be a little bit cautious. As researchers work on improving the vaccine and explore approaches for monoclonal antibodies, progress continues in developing new antimalarial drugs. The goal is to create drugs that are simple to take and inexpensive to produce and administer on a large scale, and to stay one step ahead of the constant challenge of drug resistance. Many of the new developments in vector control, vaccines, and drug therapies are years away from being implemented in the field. And that reality is particularly troubling when you look at the potential for the implementation of new tools to be outpaced by the spread of drug resistance. I'm physically based on the Thai-Myanmar border. We are the sort of the epicenter of drug resistant malaria. If you trace the history of the fight against malaria, the race against drug resistance leads back to this small corner of the world time and time again. When chloroquine resistance emerged in Southeast Asia and spread to Africa, that resulted in the, in the 1990s in millions of deaths, millions. Recently, the history is also repeating itself. We start to see the malaria parasites which are resistant to artemisinin combination therapy or the ACT. ACTs, artemisinin-based combination therapies, are widely thought to be the best malaria drug therapies we've ever had. If we lose the drugs, we will not be able to control malaria. And there are new drugs on the horizon, but at least three to five years before the new drugs arrive. The bottom line is that it's much better to eliminate malaria than to control it. In order to eliminate malaria here, a consortium of organizations is working in communities to diagnose and treat as many people as possible. Early diagnosis and quick treatment can be life-saving, not only for the recipient, but for their community as well. If you manage to treat uh, the people within the first 48 hours of their fever, they don't transmit malaria. Now we see that Falciparam is on the rise again. We are trying our best to keep this kind of logistic chain and, and keep our malaria post and malaria program alive. Malaria is a disease of the most remote, difficult to access places. You know, the further away you go from health structures, the more malaria. If you have war, such as in Myanmar, it comes back, bang. I think what people need to understand is that it's far from over. We must 
throw everything that we can at trying to, to defeat malaria. We're all looking for that holy grail and maybe one day we will get there. But I think that right now it's proven to us that we need several tools and we need to keep having innovative tools. So we keep looking for something that is better. <laughs>